Good morning. I am Dr. Kimberly Mayfield, Dean of the School of Education here at Holy Names University. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our campus and the Valley Performing Arts Center for this candidate forum for the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction for the State of California. In 1868, the Sisters of the Holy Names of Jesus and Mary arrived in Oakland to the shores of Lake Merritt with the core value of serving women and children. In 1926, the university began to prepare candidates to become credentialed teachers. Presently, we offer three credentials, the multiple subjects credential, single subjects credential, and education specialist mild moderate credential. We also offer the bilingual authorization for Spanish and a master's in urban education. Consistent with the sisters' mission to serve underserved populations, we are proud to share that we offer a Logan Scholarship, which will take care of 50% of the tuition for candidates who have a 3.0 who want to teach children. We hope that you enjoy this candidate forum today, that you learn, that you ask questions, and most of all, that you experience the radical hospitality that is a cornerstone of the core values of the Sisters of the Holy Names of Jesus and Mary. That's our wonderful department chair. My name is Kitty Kelly Epstein. I'm a member of the education department and I'm privileged to work with Dr. Mayfield and with others on the education department who are here. I want to, um, I'm on the faculty here. I also host a radio show on KPFA and I write frequently for the Oakland Post. Holy Names has a department that was the first in the state to focus on urban communities. Oakland, Richmond, Hayward, we focused our attention on the needs of urban students. We were also the first in the state to actually talk about and research and work on the fact that the teaching population in California is too white. And we recognize this and we began working on it in many ways a long time ago. As a result, we have what is probably the most diverse student population of people becoming teachers and the most diverse faculty of any program in the state because we've worked on it so hard. We also recognize though to move forward we need some help from the state of California in breaking down the barriers that make it difficult for people to become teachers. And these are things that we hope that all California elected officials will pay attention to, but particularly the new state superintendent of instruction. I want to introduce one of our students who will make a couple comments before we move on with the program. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Tamila Jackson, and I am a master's candidate here at Holy Names University, and I am pursuing a multiple subjects credential. It is with great honor that we welcome the assemblymen here for this debate today at Holy Names University. I'm sure we are all eager to hear them share their ideas and plans to help our communities progress forward because current conditions require change. As both candidates grace the stage to answer our questions and consider our viewpoints, I encourage us all to listen for that change. As a growing community, we have to make adaptations to what we already do to make it even better. Retain what works and throw out what does not. As a representative of the African American female population at Holy Names and a parent to a kindergartner at Chabot, I am here listening for that change. Without change, everything stays the same. And I don't think that plan works for us. We are too diverse, we are strong, and we all make a difference. Thank you.
Welcome. My name is Lenise Jones, and I'm with Black Women Organized for Political Action. Thank you all for coming this morning to join us for what will be a very informational candidates forum. It is not an endorsement forum today. Um, it is largely for your information. I would love to take this time to acknowledge our elected officials and who we have. Cheryl Hansen with Mount Diablo School Board. Hello. Tanya Love is representing State Assembly Member Rob Bonta. Hello, Tanya. We have the Honorable Nina Sin, who is a trustee on the Oakland Unified School District Board. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Marie Elaine Burns. She's the president of Mayor College. Thank you for coming. Also, I would love to thank Dr. Kimberly Mayfield, serving as our host, uh, Dean of Education. I am so proud of her, and unfortunately, she was not able to join us, but we had the wonderful welcome on behalf of her department. I would like, now like to introduce my partner, Kelly Todd. Hi, I'm Kelly Todd Griffin, and I'm with Sister Lack um, Inc., um, which is an organization that focuses on empowering women of color, particularly black women. So today, um, form, we are here because, can you change the slide? Thank you. Um, we in in March of 2018, we hosted um, over 40 black women leaders throughout the state for the state of black women in California and looked at the quality of life indexes across the board. And education was one that kind of rose up of a concern of ours because we recognized as 74% of the black households are headed by single black mothers that many times they are engaged in educational experiences and educational achievement of their students without having the information that they need or the skills that they need to navigate through the system. So in order for us to kind of make a real um, noticeable change in the efforts of our children, we wanted to come together and do this candidates forum for informational. There are 1.1 million black females in the state of California. We're the third largest population, um, black women population throughout the country, only behind Georgia and New York. And so we understand that our power is in our numbers and our power is in our focus. And so we want to focus on the superintendent of public instruction because we know that our children are being in environments that are not the environments that are set up for success. And so we know that these two candidates are strong advocates for improving achievement gaps as well as improving experience. And we wanted to provide an opportunity for them to share that information with you. So two things that we want to say in terms of housekeeping. We are broadcasting live on Facebook, and we are streaming live. Because we understand, again, with black women being in a position to be head of households and having the responsibility of their families, many of them do not get an opportunity to come to forums like this. Most of the time, it's those of us that are the most engaged. Typically, it's activists and advocates. And so we wanted to create this space, which we consider a safe space, we also consider it a space to share the candidates' views on specific issues that are specifically for African-American student achievement and experience. So we want to thank you and welcome you to this phone form. As you know the statistics, we know that there's a lot of work to do. and We know that it's going to take a lot of effort, not just from these candidates, but also many of you. So thank you for coming. And we really look forward to a very robust discussion. Thank you. Good morning. 
My name is Regina Brown Wilson, and I am the Chair and Executive Director of California Black Media. Um, and I'm going to introduce our moderator. Kimberly Ellis is the founder of Unbought and Bossed, an incubator for the next generation of political disruptors. As the former Executive Director of Emerge California, the state's most effective training program for Democratic women who run for office, Kimberly is a nationally recognized progressive leader who has been credited with revolutionizing the democratic politics in California. Kimberly has appeared on syndicated television and radio and is frequently interviewed by leading political media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Associated Press. And I'm gonna go ahead and add black media. She is, she's a frequent contributor also to a number of online uh, print dailies, including the San Francisco Chronicle, Los Angeles Times and Huffington Post. Most recently, Kimberly was a candidate for the chair of the California Democratic Party, where she inspired thousands and lit the spark of an ongoing movement for the next generation of progressive activists. Kimberly serves on a number of boards and advisory councils, including Fund Her, K to College, and the Young Dems Black Caucus. Kimberly Ellis. Obviously not Kimberly Ellis. I'm Dr. Ramona Bishop. I'm just here to remind each one of you that this is going to be a nonpartisan informational conversation. It is designed to be that way. And before I bring up Marshall and Tony, I just want to say enjoy yourselves and it's time to really get the information that we need to make great decisions about the future of California. So are we going to enjoy ourselves, everyone? Yeah. Yes. And without further ado, let me bring forward. Let's talk about California's public schools. Did you know that every year, California spends $71,000 per prisoner, but only $16,000 per student? It's no wonder our public schools rank 44th in the nation. In the public schools I led, we invest in our classrooms. We gave teachers the resources they needed, and we raised graduation rates by 60%. I'm running for state superintendent because we can do that across California. Let's get it done. My name is Tony Thurman. Education isn't the goal, it's the gateway. And California classrooms hold the key to every child's opportunity. We reject Trump's attacks on our public schools and invest in the teachers who lift up our California dreamers, modernize our curriculum, and empower educators to teach beyond the test. Because creativity and critical thinking are as important as facts and figures. I'm Tony Thurman, and the work starts now. Tony Thurman for State Superintendent. Please give a resounding round of applause for candidates for State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Marshall Tuck and Tony Thurman. Resounding. Thank you.
welcome you and are excited to present today's forum featuring our two candidates for Superintendent of Public Instruction, uh, Assemblymember Tony Thurman, and Marshall Tuck. for you guys to use. We are good students. We follow instructions. <laughs> uh, a couple of housekeeping items. If you could please uh, turn your phones to the off or vibrate position. And also please save your questions to the very end. Also have one announcement to make on behalf of the speaker series presented by the Graduate Education Program here at Holy Names. They are hosting a series of panel conversations over the next several weeks. Uh, the first of which is entitled Hip Hop for Change uh, and Education to address the injustices of representation through education, community building, and creation of a platform for students. The second, uh, that one will be on Saturday, September 29th, so that is coming up very soon. The next one will be on October 27th. It is entitled School Choice. It is a panel conversation with Holy Name <coughs> University faculty and community members. The next one is on December 1st. It is entitled No Estas Solo. It is a panel discussion including Dr. McCall Perez, on supporting Latinx students and families. And then finally, on January 26th of next year, Mindful Schools and Urban Dharma, a conversation about mindfulness and education in our schools. So in the room today, we have Californians from Sacramento to San Diego, and everything in between. 70% of today's attendees are women, and the majority of the people range in age between 35 and 64. So we have millennials, Gen X, and baby boomers represented here today, and thousands more who are joining us online, virtually through the Facebook live stream. The incredible response to today's event is indicative of just how important this issue is and how serious we are about finding solutions that support, elevate, and set up our children for all of life's successes. So again, I wanna welcome you both to today's conversation. Both of you come to this race with an incredible amount of experience and enthusiasm, and for that we thank you. And as it relates to this job for Superintendent of Public Instruction, which is essentially the top pop for education in California, we are most interested in how you plan to channel your experience and enthusiasm to affect real, substantive change to improve the educational outcomes and successes for all children in California, and as it relates to this conversation today, for black children in California. So with that, let's get started. F is for failure. California bills itself as the BBLB, the big blue liberal bastion of the country, a trendsetter and trailblazer for all things progressive, including policy. While that might be true for some issues, when it comes to public education, the Golden State isn't exactly ahead of the class. And in fact, it is failing many of its students miserably. Currently, California ranks 41st in the nation on K through 12 per pupil spending. Juxtaposed against our number one ranking on per prisoner spending, it is truly one of those things that makes you go, hmm. And when it comes to black student achievement and experiences, the statistics are even worse. Black students are twice as likely as white students to be identified for special education. 
Black boys and girls at an early age are less likely to have access to preschool programs. Black students are twice as likely to feel unsafe at school as white students. Not only does the Superintendent of Public Instruction direct all functions of the Department of Education, they also provide education policy and direction to local school boards throughout California. So with that in mind, one of my mentors, Delaney Houston, who recently ran for governor of California, is a former superintendent of public instruction, and in fact, she is the only woman to have ever held that position. One of Delaney's mantras is that budgets are statements of values. Budgets are statements of values. Based on the fact that today California ranks 41st in per pupil spending, number one in per prisoner spending, would you say that California's democratically controlled elected leadership and government values students and education? And if not, what will you do and what is your commitment to use your power of influence to increase the amount of per pupil funding that flows to school districts? I will start uh, on my far left with you, Tony. Thank you for the question, and thank you, uh, Black Women Leading and Mothers and Others for Leading. You know, uh, we have been beset by laws that have made us 46 in the nation for people to spend it. Throughout my entire political career, I have been campaigning to create a split rule tax and reform Prop 13, which allows big corporations in our state to not pay their fair share and rob our kids of a great education. When Prop 13 passed, um, prior to Prop 13's passage, uh, California was number one in per pupil spending. Uh, after the passage of Prop 13, uh, by my count, we we're somewhere between 41st and 46th. We were also 43rd in the nation in third grade reading and third grade math. My top priority will be to provide more funding uh, for our education and to make our per pupil spending number one. And we can do that now. And I'm going to be championing a ballot measure uh, that would help us to bring $11 billion to our state budget and would provide almost $6 billion for K-12 education. That will be on the ballot in 2020. That's my top priority. Uh, I've used my time in the legislature to help bring more money to schools. Um, I've moved $35 million out of the criminal justice system and put it directly into K-12 education, into programs that allow our kids to educate and not be incarcerated. I've introduced a tax on private prisons that profit off of, you know, uh, incarcerating our kids uh, that could generate millions to support uh, a universal preschool program start in our state. And I'm very proud that over the last four years, uh, we provided a billion dollars for early education because the achievement gap starts before kindergarten. We've got to make sure that we equip our kids with the ability to learn, to read, so they can read to learn in whatever areas that they wish to go forward. And so uh, I'm committed uh, to making it uh, my top priority to make our funding of our public school education number one. Uh, I've been chipping away at it as a legislature uh, in ways that take money from the criminal justice system and that expand our programs. This year we provided $100 million to support uh, special education programs and STEM and STEAM education programs. We provided $300 million to support career technical education uh, for our programs. Um, and we won't stop there because uh, clearly we have so much more to do and the state budget is very uh, dependent on uh, fluctuating revenue from tax measures and sales tax. What I'm saying is we need a permanent funding source to ensure that our kids get a top quality education and I will make that a hallmark of my uh, tenure as state superintendent of public instruction. Great, thank you. Uh, first, thank you all for coming again on a Saturday morning and really appreciate California Black Media, really appreciate Sistelec, and really appreciate Black Women Organized for Political Action for putting this event on. Um, it was fun hearing the speakers that started off. Everyone said we need change. So we need change in our public schools. And we absolutely have to have change. State of California right now in mathematics, Asian Americans, 72% proficient in math. Whites, 53% proficient in math. Latinos, 25% proficient in math. African Americans, 18% proficient in math. That is a highly unequal system. It is a highly broken system. All of our kids across all races, all cultures, are all at the same skill level. So we have a systematic failure 
in our public schools that is impacting our black youth the most. And we need real change. And the question was, I love that comment, priorities are about your budget. The state of California is 41st in the most recent data, 41st in the country, which means 40 other states are prioritizing their kids at a higher level than the legislature in the state of California is. And the question was, are our elected officials actually prioritizing our kids in our public schools? And the answer is no. Because if they were, we wouldn't be 41st. And even with the money that we have, they're not prioritizing our kids at greatest need. They're not prioritizing our black youth. Governor Brown passed local control funding formula. Additional dollars for high need students, a great piece of policy, so important. I've worked for 15 years in education. I've led two public school systems in Inglewood, South LA, Watts, and East LA. There's no question our African American youth, our Latino youth need more resources. That bill got passed. But the current state superintendent, who's a part of the existing system, told school districts, you can use that money for cross the board raises, even if those raises don't impact people who are working with our black youth or Latino youth. So even when we have additional dollars that's supposed to go to our neediest kids, it doesn't. And you look at the end of the day, it's unacceptable where we're at. We absolutely have to increase funding. I led a group called the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools, 15,000 kids, 18 schools, all district public schools in Los Angeles, neediest schools in LA. We raised $100 million, almost $1,000 more per kid to help our schools have more success. So we have focused, differentiated programs for our black children, for our Latino children. That's where we need real change. We absolutely have to get serious about, and, and Assemblymember Thurman and I both agree, we have to get serious about the corporate side of Prop 13 and make changes there for more dollars. The state also, by the way, courts just said, state now is getting more sales tax for online sales. Every single one of those dollars, it's new money, should go to our public schools. We need people who are elected who are going to put our kids first. We gotta have an educator who's done this work with a proven track record of actually prioritizing our black children with real success and real results. Look at what people have done. We gotta change it. We need an educator who's delivered results, not another politician. Because the fundamental question you ask, no, our state has not got the job done for our schools. Doesn't mean our kids aren't great. Doesn't mean our teachers aren't working hard. But the system is not working. We need fundamental change that starts with the right state to for this job. So you both touched on two things that um, I think are really important. Number one, uh, closing the achievement gap, and number two, increasing funding. Um, the truth of the matter is the superintendent of public instruction does not really have direct discretion over the budget. So really this is about uh, using uh, your influence and the power of your bully pulpit to ensure that whoever our next governor is and our uh, uh, next members of our legislature are prioritizing our children. Uh, understanding that the achievement gap between white students and, and black students has barely narrowed over the last 50 years. So I would love to hear, I think the audience would love to hear some specific um, things that you plan to do in order to wield your influence to get our legislature uh, and, and our governor to move in the direction of, of truly prioritizing uh, uh, kids. Yeah, so um, it starts with the, the state superintendent actually has a lot more authority than just the bully pulpit, but uh, in many ways, because this job's been held by politicians for the last 25 years, people don't realize that this job, by law, can interpret all of the existing laws on the books. And so part of the job of state superintendent is to actually interpret laws for school districts on how to actually move forward. As I mentioned, there was a law that was passed that's given billions of dollars more to school districts that serve low-income kids, English learners, and foster kids. The current state superintendent made a decision, his legal authority, that that money could be used for across-the-board raises rather than for that money to go to the kids where it is intended. On day one, we're gonna change that interpretation. And by the way, the legislature could have passed any bill for the last four years to force that money to go to the kids of greatest need. It has not. So there's real authority. That's a couple billion dollars we're gonna get to make sure it goes to our kids of greatest needs out of the gate. That's essential. The second thing the state superintendent can do is actually require districts to be much more transparent. So we're gonna launch an equity audit across our schools because change comes with transparency. And what most people in the state don't know is how unequal our public schools are. Our black youth have less experienced teachers and principals, 
in their classrooms, in their schools, that turn over much more often. That is a fact. Until that fact changes, you don't solve the achievement gap. We're gonna, our black students are offered less college prep programs than white and Asian students. That is a fact. We're gonna bring these facts to the public so we can actually run an equity audit across all school districts, across all demographics, to truly see how consistently, how much consistency of instruction is there for our black youth. What's the curriculum? Are we truly offering our black youth college prep classes? Are we truly actually graduating our youth and giving them the opportunity to go to college at the same rates? Do we actually have the right counsel and support? We gotta bring these issues to the public. And then when you think about coming back, you gotta work with the governor and the legislature to drive those changes. So having an educator who's done the work, who's made specific changes that have dramatically increased the improvement and success rates of our African American youth and Latino youth, which is what I've done, Schools I led, when we started working in, in LA, 2008, 36% graduation rate, they're now 81%, all Latino African American students, who can then work with the governor and the legislature to make sure that when we're passing policies, they're policies that actually make sense for principals and teachers and counselors in the field. But specific actions right away, we're gonna require the dollars actually go to the highest need kids, we're gonna run an equity audit, we're also gonna actually push for more flexibility for our teachers, principals, counselors locally, while in parallel working with the legislature and working with the superintendent, I mean with the governor. And I'll say, in the legislature, you know, I'm not a member of the legislature, um, but Dr. Shirley Weber, who I believe is the leading education leader and advocate in the state legislature, who's just fighting for our kids aggressively, she supports my campaign. And if you ask her, she says she supports my campaign because I actually will bring real change and I've done the work. Our kids absolutely need it. State of California right now, 51% of whites have college degrees, only 33% of blacks. A fundamentally failed system for African Americans, it's time for real change. You have to ask yourself why the achievement gap has persisted, and if you look at the achievement gap, it is reflective of the treatment and the disparity that African Americans experience in every single sector. It is not limited to case law education. The disproportionality in healthcare, in the criminal justice system, in economic development. You need only walk around any block in this city to see the kind of change that has happened to push African Americans out, to decline, to reduce the enrollment of African American students in these districts, and to take money away from these very districts that we are trying to serve. Now, I'm very proud of the work that we've done even recently to generate millions of dollars to support Oakland Unified, in Inglewood, in West Contra Costa, to keep these districts out of bankruptcy so they can create quality programming to support our students. And while audits and transparency are critical, they by themselves will not move the needle to help our children. We need to have an incredible literacy campaign like the one that I've led with the Freedom School that works with students to give them an intervention to learn to love reading. I taught a high school class, a civics class, of kids who are in the juvenile justice system. Imagine getting your diploma in behind bars. And I went to that group, we taught them a civics class, and I thought the best way to teach them civics is to bring them to the state capitol and have them work with me on a piece of legislation that they introduced, a bill that says let's give the right kind of support services to our kids to keep them out of the criminal justice system. And mind you, I put them on the dais so they can introduce the bill, because I want them to think like they might be a legislator. Because I've lived the achievement gap. My entire life has been a conversation about changing the needle in conversation. From, from being a student who attended schools that were intended to desegregate, because we know that separate is not equal, from being a social worker and running after school and mentoring programs and college prep programs for African American and Latino students and Asian students and low income students from all backgrounds. We need real interventions that will help our kids. And I'm gonna work with the next governor to create a universal preschool program in our state. Because we know that with universal preschool, you're more likely to graduate and go to college and less likely to drop out and end up in the criminal justice system. I'm proud of working in Oakland for over 10 years with great programs like the nonprofit Lincoln that has a great <coughs> program to reduce chronic absenteeism for our kids. Because when you don't learn to read by third grade, you are more likely to drop out. And so I'm gonna to continue to work to expand our programs to reduce chronic absenteeism, to expand literacy intervention programs like the Freedom School, to make sure that we create a universal preschool program, 
to expand early education because we should be reading, talking, and singing to our babies from the time that they are born so that they cannot fall into the achievement gap. But if we stop there and we don't talk about the kind of inequity that has led to the achievement gap in every single sector for African Americans and Latinos and, and low income people, we will not see the needle change. We've got to be out there and talking about poverty and creating jobs for the parents of our students so they can afford to live in these communities and support our kids. That's why I've invested so much in STEAM education, because the jobs and technology are going to be great, but we're going to have only half the applicants who can do those jobs. It's why I'm advocating to expand computer science so that our kids, regardless of their background, can be in those jobs of tomorrow and earn a decent wage for their family. We've got to be able to push back and address the issue of racism in institutional bias. And it is not in just education. It is in every single sector. It's why we see African-American males more so than any other group incarcerated and pushed out of school. And I worked with Madeline Cronenberg and another great school board member who's here, Audrey Miles, and we reduced suspensions in our school district by 27% in one year. Because we don't want our black kids being pushed out of school. If you push out, you can't learn. And we increased our graduation rates, we increased our test scores specifically for African-American students. But it is not enough. We have to do more for African-American students and for all. And as superintendent, I'll bring real programs, real change, and real urgency to close the achievement gap in our state. So I, I, I agree uh, with both of you that in order to bring about real change, we really have to get to the root causes of a lot of these issues. And so uh, you talked about racism and implicit bias. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, recently, there's been a lot of noise around the way in which black students are disciplined in the school environment. Many black moms have been called to the school to address so-called behavioral issues. As reported by Black Parallel School Board, it showed that a school district in California had schools that had suspension rates at over 60% for black students. Black female students are the fastest growing group of suspensions. And we are hearing stories about black youth as young as kindergarten being suspended. Uh, what are your thoughts on is there implicit bias that plays into this, a part of this, um, this disproportionate level of discipline? And what do you personally plan to do uh, in your administration to adjust, address it? I'll start with, with, with Marshall. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, I've, I've done this work and I've seen this firsthand. There absolutely is implicit bias, and there's discrimination, and there's racism. There's, there's no other way to justify the results in our schools today. African Americans are 6% of the student population and 20% of suspensions. That is guaranteed by us. African Americans, males, are 26% identified special education when the average in the state is 12%. And this is not new. This has been the case over and over and over again for decades. Fundamentally broken. And it's so important to push at the next level of detail. Because there's been, there's been speeches for decades and decades in this school system, but the achievement gaps haven't closed at all. So we've got to figure out what do we specifically change. In 2008, we started working at Markham Middle School in the heart of Watts. It's the lowest performing middle school in all of LA Unified. Four different neighborhoods, four different actually serious gang zones coming out of school. We had a 33% suspension rate across the entire campus, above 50% for African Americans, to your point. So what do we do? What do we do in the school? Step one, we actually held the principal accountable for suspension that go down. They have to go down, right? You gotta start with school leadership, because they set the tone. We actually retrained our teachers intensively, focus on cultural competency. Our student population has changed dramatically in the last several decades. Our teacher training, both at the university level and at the school level, we don't touch cultural competency in a more direct way. We don't touch discrimination and racism in the way we need to, and we have to, because our teaching and administrative population is very different in terms of race, culture, and background than most of our students. So you have to make those changes. We made those changes. We made sure we actually had stable teachers and principals. This point cannot be emphasized enough. Markham Middle School had 35% turnover of teachers every single year before we got there. We have a system that guarantees right now that our kids of color, 
have less experienced teachers and principals in front of them. You gotta actually pay, we, we pay principals more to work in Watts in East LA and South LA because they're harder jobs. And you need to do that across the state of California. We give bonuses for teachers to attract them and to stay at our schools. We put in place restorative justice. A lot of adults had lost their way, yelling at kids, we pushing kids. No, we didn't. You push a kid, you're off campus. I wasn't always the most popular person with the establishment of the current system, but it was very clear. If you are biased, we're pulling you off in terms of that adult. Suspensions, way down. Across all of our schools, the partnership, 24% we started, it's 2% today. Markham Middle School was 35, 33% we started, over 50% for African Americans, less than 3% today. And it's not just about when you should end suspensions. The question is, what additional supports are you putting in place on the campus? So if a kid asks you, is misbehaving, let's actually go into a restorative justice circle. Let's have more counselors actually deal with their real social emotional needs. You need an educator who's done this work before to do the work. It's money matters a lot, but if we don't change practices, it won't change. Washington, D.C was the highest funded school district in the country, serving mostly black students, and it had the lowest performing results that didn't change the system. We need real change in our schools, and we have to absolutely have real training, real focus, and no tolerance for that bias, but you gotta actually put in real training for not just teachers, counselors, teachers, principals, superintendents. The system is fundamentally broken for our young people, it's gotta change. We reduced those suspensions by 27% was through restorative justice. So as a legislator, I provided resources to 30 districts to have restorative justice, including Oakland Unified, West Contra Costa, LA Unified, and districts throughout our state. $35 million that we took out of the criminal justice system, put it in K-12 education, so districts could use restorative justice to support our kids. There is absolutely bias um, in education and in every single sector. And we have to provide the kind of professional development that allows educators to recognize implicit bias and how to support our students. And you know, I'm not waiting for this election to be over to talk about the achievement gap and what strategies will work. I've convened a number of meetings throughout the state where we've brought educators together to look at what educators are doing to address their achievement gap and why their test scores are where they are and how we give more coaching and guidance to those who are doing the educating. And one of the things that I intend to lead is a new campaign that will allow us to increase the number of African-American and Latino men who teach in our elementary schools as a method for closing the achievement gap. Because as the moderator said, kids are being suspended and expelled in kindergarten. You don't need to have any more data than to hear that to know that there is a bias. And so what can a kindergartner do to be expelled from school? If we can't see that coming and intervene in ways that support that young people, shame on us as a system. And so we should no longer allow anyone on our campuses to criminalize our campuses. Police forces on campus are not the dean of students. We have to use restorative justice and intervention programs to support our students. Professional development, the research will show you professional development is the greatest way to help our educators help our students as it relates to closing the achievement gap. We don't give our, our educators any professional development. We send them to, we pick one teacher at a school and say we're gonna send you to a training and you're supposed to come back on your own time and do a turnaround training for everybody at the school. So that's like setting us up for failure right from the jump. That's why as a legislator I have invested uh, with my colleagues $100 million this year just for professional development to support our teachers. I can't tell you how many teachers have told me I'm still teaching to the old methods because they haven't given me the training to the new Alliance State standards. We don't want to teach our kids to memorize tests. We want to emphasize critical thinking for our kids and civics education and bilingual education and dual language instruction. All of our kids should be speaking multiple languages because they are the global leaders of today and tomorrow. I got a bill on the governor's desk right now that would expand dual language instruction in all of our schools. Our kids should be bilingual and they should also be scientists. Like my 12 year old daughter says, Daddy, I'm gonna be a scientist. I said, baby, you can do a great job as a scientist. But I said, listen, two rules. When you do your experiments, clean it up for yourself and don't blow up the house, okay? <laughs> we should encourage and provide rigor to all of our students, but give them the support and the resources that they need to get it done. And so through restorative justice, we've led. We've reduced suspensions. 
my colleagues will tell you, as a school board member, I vote, I probably drove them crazy. I voted against every single expulsion hearing. Because uh, I don't believe we should expel our kids and push them out. I think that we should find ways to support them, embrace them, and educate them. And so, there's two educators sitting on this stage right now. We come at it from different ways. I come at it from being a teacher who teaches kids who are incarcerated. I've come at it from being a social worker on campus. I've come at it from being the director of the after school programs. I've come at it from being the director of the college prep program for African American, Latino, and Asian students. I come at it as a person who's brought students into his home to make sure that they graduate from high school. The young man told me that no man in his family has ever gotten his high school diploma. He said, Tony, I can't get a GED. He said, because no person in my family has ever graduated with a diploma. Well, my brother did graduate and get his diploma, and he's out in the community, and he's working and raising his family, because that's what I believe in. These are not just talking points for me. This is my life's mission, and together, all of us need to make sure we support all of our students in this system. The short answer is yes, and I've started already on pursuing a program that will provide a scholarship to anyone who wants to become a teacher as a start. And then I'm looking at, you know, I'm raising two kids in our, in our public schools, and um, the district where, you know, my kids attend school has had to replace 200 teachers every year for the last four years. And when you exit, interview, and survey these teachers about why they left, the number one reason that they give is they cannot afford to live where they were. And it's for those reasons that I've introduced a first of its kind piece of legislation, a teacher housing bill, to help build affordable housing for our educators, teachers, and classified staff. Because with that kind of turnover, you cannot close the achievement gap. And so we've got to provide the method for educators in training to become our teachers. We should be building our pipeline programs of young people right now in middle school, in high school, in Richmond, in Oakland, in Watts, in LA, to let them not only dream about becoming an educator, but to give them the resources to become an educator. And the bill that I carried this year that the governor signed to give $300 million for career technical education means that that young person right now who is sitting in this audience maybe and saying that I'd like to be that teacher can get access to an internship, an opportunity to learn about what it means to be an educator. And I'll continue to build on the scholarship programs, the housing programs, that will allow us to attract more educators and to give them professional development. We do not provide any professional development and we've got to give support to our teachers. And as I mentioned in the previous question, uh, that I will work to launch a new program that allows us to have African American and Latino teachers in our elementary schools so that we build a cadre of educators. I'm for giving principals more money. I'm for giving teachers more money. I'm saying let's give them all more money. I don't want to create a, a, a two-tier system of how some people get money and some people don't. I don't want to create a system where people teach to the test because they got a bonus. I want to make sure that we invest in the entire teaching core and that we support and nurture good teachers. This year, I introduced a bill that helps a program where you get to mentor teachers, where you get veteran teachers to mentor new teachers. Because I'm sorry, not everybody's born knowing how to do classroom management. And that's not just something that you come to. But when you get to be with a great educator, they help you understand how to approach your classroom. Because our class sizes are bigger, our kids do have more challenge, and we do have to provide more resources for our kids who experience social economic challenges. The biggest enemy that puts our kids in the achievement gap is poverty. And we have got to do work to support our kids who have been homeless and who are hungry. We, we, how do you learn? There are 20,000 homeless kids in LA County. 
How do you learn when you're homeless? How do you learn when you're hungry? That's why I passed a bill that makes 400,000 more kids eligible for the free and reduced lunch program. I was that kid on the free lunch program. I ate my lunch under the desk because I was embarrassed and I got teased for eating school lunch. I became an adult and I realized all my friends were on the free lunch program. <laughs> you know, same thing, I was on public assistance. I ate so much government cheese I thought USDA was a brand name. But these programs, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I didn't want it, but it was the best grilled cheese sandwich I ever had. You know what I'm talking about. Gave me that big old box, you had to cut through the plastic. But look, these programs helped my family get out of poverty. I had teachers who said, Tony, even though I lost my mother when I was six years old to cancer, my father was a veteran in the in Vietnam War who I found on the internet after 30 years. I was raised by a cousin who I never met who had a high school diploma and worked as a nurse's aide caring for sick people. But she believed in education, and my teachers did too. And they said, education will carry you far. And they invested me with rigor. They didn't lower the bar. Our kids can perform as well as anybody else. We have to set the bar high and give them the support to get there. And so this is what I'm talking about, that we can do this together. We give kids the support they need. We train our teachers, allow them to get good salaries. If someone's not doing a good job, then they shouldn't be in that profession. We can make those changes. But it starts by saying we invest in our kids, we invest in their educators, and invest in their families. That's why I'm talking about adult education all the time. Invest in their families as well. There's, there's nothing more important in a school that a school can control than the teacher in front of a child. And the principal supports that teacher. Nothing more important. It's the most important thing in a school that a school can control. And, and our job is education. The current system of public education in California has a number of systematic policies and practices that reinforce African American youth and Latino youth not having a high quality teacher in front of them every single day. That reinforce wealthier neighborhoods having more experienced teachers and principals in their schools than our low income kids that are built into the system. And when we talk about education, it may not be the most interesting stuff. You gotta go to the next level of detail on what are these systematic problems? And why don't we have teachers that actually look like our kids, come from their cultures, and wanna work in our toughest schools? The first reason, because we're not graduating enough black young people and Latino young people, right? We have, there's a 30, only 30% of African American youth that start ninth grade actually finish college prepared, uh, finish high school prepared for college. That means, and there's actually, and in terms of the number of graduates, you're talking about 15%. And this profession requires credential. For whites and Asians, it's about 50%. So you, we actually gotta fundamentally fix pre-K through 12 to get more young people of color graduating and then coming and teaching. That's the foundational area as to why we don't have enough teachers who are who look like our kids and feel like our kids and come from communities like our kids. Secondly, we have policies that reinforce our young people to not have teachers in front of them they're gonna stay. We took over the lowest performance schools in Los Angeles. If you now walk down first day at Markham Middle School, first day at Sandy High School, you had teacher turnover 30%. You had substitutes in these classrooms at a ridiculous number. This wasn't high income kids. So black youth, Latino youth, this wasn't new. It had been that way for decades. So why is that? Why does that happen? One, it happens because we give no additional support or incentives for people to work in our toughest schools. Markham Middle School is a harder job than Beverly Hills Middle School, tougher job. So one, you gotta pay people more to work there. I believe in it strongly. If you're gonna work in our toughest schools, you should get paid more. It helps you come and stay in that job. Secondly, we gave our teachers more supports, more counseling supports, better principals that can actually focus on their job of teaching. You have to fundamentally shift that. Secondly, we have policies that don't make sense. This state has a law that says if a school has to do layoffs, it's only done based on seniority. Built in a state law, we know for a fact, it is a fact, African American youth have younger teachers than white, than white youth and Asian youth. So that law, by definition, guarantees that there are layoffs. Who gets hurt the most? Who gets hurt the most? Our African American kids. You gotta change those policies. They don't make sense for our needy kids. Los Angeles, you have what's called must place teachers. A teacher that actually cannot get a job on their own is in the system. Our schools had a much, much, much higher percentage of must place teachers than our highest need schools. And then, sorry, than the high income schools. That's been that way for decades. These are laws built into our state. 
decisions made by the legislature that has not changed these laws or changed these practices. If we want to get serious about how do you ensure we have diverse teaching force, how do you ensure kids have high quality teaching, you've got to fundamentally change the system. And more money is a part of it, but it is not all of it. What does is, what is change the system look like? What does that look like? 2008, we got to our schools and found out that our gifted students, students in our schools test for gifted was one and a half percent. And the district average was 11%. Remember, all of our schools, all Latin after American, one and a half percent, they've been that way for decades. And people year after year just said, okay, that's okay, that's okay. We said, absolutely not, that's not okay. What's going on in this policy? You dig into the policy that adults had accepted forever, that the system had accepted. The policy said, a parent has to say, test my kid for gifted, or a teacher has to say it. Our parents didn't know that policy existed. Our teacher didn't stop actually advising our kid, uh, recommend our kids be tested gifted. So we said, we're gonna change things, dump the policy, we're gonna test all kids. And that first year, 12% of our kids, 1% higher than the district average, all Latino, all American, identified gifted. That's how you drive systematic change. Question the policy that exists and get serious about truly prioritizing our kids at greatest need. That's what I've done before, that's what I do statewide. And I'm telling you, it has not been done statewide for a long time, and that's why it's so important to have somebody who's actually done the work, who's led the work, and while we both have worked with kids for a long time, we have very different experiences in public education. I've led two school systems serving the neediest kids in Los Angeles that have had unique results in terms of success. Some of our Thurman's experience as a led to, at, on a school, in school leadership, I've been four years on a school board of a school system that had highly problematic results during those four years. We've got to look at the details, dig under the details, who's going to drive real systematic change. Look at someone who's actually done it before. Madam Moderator, I have an opportunity to address what Mr. Tucker just said about me. Just thank you. <laughs> if you want to know my resume, you should have just asked. I'm happy to tell you. Uh, I spent over 20 years in social work and working with kids directing after school programs uh, in cities that are largely African American led, running college prep programs right across the way in West Oakland for kids who went to Lowell Middle School when it was Lowell and McClymouth High School. And many of them are now working or have graduated college and have done great work. I've taught a life skills program for Alameda County, Office of Education for kids who are in the juvenile camp program, primarily African American, Latino, Asian students, all from low-income backgrounds. Yes, I've served as a school board member, and Mr. Tuck, every time you try to distort my record, well, you do distort my record, every time you do that, you're not just hurting me, you're hurting the kids in that district by telling a false narrative of a district that has historically been an African-American district, and you are distorting the truth about the work that those kids have done, that their educators have done, and if you really want to know what happened in those four years, here's what we did. We increased graduation rates for African-American students. We increased test scores for African-American students and English learners. And if you really want to know, a district that was in state receivership for 20 years before I arrived, we got them out of state control by paying down their debt five years early. And so for a person who's talking about equity, but is attacking an African-American man who's worked as an educator, yes, and as a politician, fighting for our kids, which way is it? Is it about equity? Or is it about saying whatever you need to say to impute me and put our kids to get this job? I'm risking everything to get this job, okay? I'm in a safe seat in the legislature. I love what I do, but because I care deeply about our kids who are risking it all, I'm risking everything too for African American kids and Latino kids and all six million of the kids in the great state of California. That's my resume. So uh, I'm not questioning your intent or your personal journey, and I'm also not at all disrespecting our kids who go to school every single day, and I'm not disrespecting the people who work hard every day. But if we have a system that isn't working, which we all agree, we have a current system that's not working for our black youth, we have to talk about the facts. That is the starting point to actually improve things. And it's okay to say it's broken and our kids are great and working hard. And it's okay to say the policies don't make sense for our black youth and our Latino youth and adults are working hard. You can have both. And I don't distort your record. And everything I talk about is actually fact-based. There's no, there's no name, line. So name one fact so, about what you said about me bankrupting okay. the district. I didn't say I didn't say I didn't say bankrupt at all. I just said it was not successful. Ed Trust West, which is a research group right down the street, in 2012, your last year on the school board, 
ranked West Contra Costa as the lowest performing large school district in the state of California. That is not, that is not distorting, that is a fact. And they looked at achievement, they looked at growth, they looked at suspensions, and they ranked the district in the last year on the school board as the lowest performing large school district. The Office of Civil Rights out of Washington, D.C. did an extensive investigation of West Contra Costa Unified over the years that you were there, not saying it was you, but over the years you were there in your leadership, and said that the school district had a large-scale systematic issue in terms of harassment across the district. Like, this is not distortion. I ask people to look at the facts. The ACLU sued the West Contra Costa Unified School District during your four years as a school member. That is not taken away from your intent. You have good heart, you're a good person. Intentions are not enough. We've had well-intended people work in our public schools for a long time, and what is the end result? We sit here right now in a state where the vast, vast, vast majority of African-American youth are not graduating high school ready for their future. That is where we are right now in California. And we all know, you know, I know, you know, we all know, every kid can get there. But we gotta change it. And that's about being willing to talk about the truth. What is really going on? It's being willing to actually look at the data, look at the, look at the policies, and question everything. Question everything. When we found out in our schools that over half our teachers were getting laid off, this is in 2009, half our teachers getting laid off, we didn't accept it. We said, this doesn't make sense. Seniority-based layoffs coming out of state, out of state legislature. We called the governor, called the union, called the school district and said, our neediest kids are gonna lose all their teachers. They said, there's nothing we can do about it. That's the system. So we called the ACLU and we sued the state and the school district. And we won the lawsuit and our, te our kids were able to keep their teachers. That, that's called taking on the system. So I think, I certainly know you and I both, I, I, I'll tell, I won't assume you. I, I know you have a good heart, I know you're well-intentioned. I'm not questioning the intent. But for this big system to change, we gotta have more than intention, but the folks who have a proven track record of taking on the system and bringing solutions. Okay, if, I'm if, gonna, I'm I'm gonna, gonna, if I could, if I could, just I'm a gonna, moment, I'm Madam Moderator. I'm going to move us along because this next question actually does tie into the, the basically what we've been talking about, which is systems change. Um, and uh, I want to continue it as it relates to diversity because most of us know that California is a people of color majority state. The majority of people who live in the state of California are people of color. Um, and as it relates to the sort of ecosystem in education, uh, Marshall, you made a comment, leadership starts at the top and it sets the tone. So understanding that this is an ecosystem, um, as it relates to your administration, what is your commitment to hiring and retaining diverse staff in the State Department Specifically, what efforts would you put in place to ensure that historically underrepresented and marginalized communities, including women, uh, have key leadership positions in your administration? And then finally, would you be willing to commit to an inclusion writer? Basically, a quota. So, I'll start with you. The short sure answer is yes. If you look at my track record, you know, if you look at the staff that I've hired in the legislature, I probably have the most diverse staff. A majority African American staff, followed by Latino staff, Asian and white, um, and women staff and leadership um, who run my district, who chair the committees that I chair, who staff the committees that I chair, all women in leadership. Um, and yes, as a superintendent, I will be committed to seeing that at the highest level of that office, that we have people of color, women of color, because right now there are very few, and that has been a concern of the Department of Education. There's 1,400 people working in Sacramento in, in that office, and many people feel that uh, nothing good can come in or come out, and it is time to make changes, and uh, I'm very committed to that. But what is very important is not just about what the superintendent does with who he or she hires to work in that office. It's very important that the superintendent have a relationship and the ability to work with the next governor and the 120 <coughs> members of the legislature and the 58 county superintendents throughout our state. The superintendent does not have direct control over any school district in this state, but through his or her relationships with the people who do, you can bring more funding, more resources, more support, and more accountability. And that's what I intend to do. Mr. Chuck, I appreciate that you clarified your statement in the last panel. Because just before that, you basically said that I you know, ran a bad district and you clarified, which I appreciate, 
What I'd like you to do is just speak on balance. Because the reality is you can pick a stat that is negative um, for any body of work that either you or I have done. And I'll never run from that. And I'll never run from the fact that yes, we need systemic change. You, you cherry pick what happened in one year at the end of my term, I could do the same thing and say that the school that you founded, Green Dot, has the highest uh, uh, suspension rate for African American students. So just speak on balance about how this works. And if you don't agree with the policies that I'm advocating for, that's fine. I understand I won't get your vote, but I'm working hard to get the votes of other Californians who want to see change. And change means having experience in education. It also means having experience getting things done at a broad system level, working with the governor and the legislature. And I think I've done that quite well. Um, so, so on the, I'll, I'll mention one or two of the things there and then, then jump into the diversity question. Uh, one with Green Dot, 2017 18 school year, 3.3% suspension rate across the school system. 3.3% is still too high, um, but I'm not sure that 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 stat is accurate that you send along. Secondly, just as a reminder, the state actually does run a couple school districts. So the, the, the state has taken over a few different school districts, which it actually does run. Uh, Inglewood Unified, the state took over six years ago, uh, and it has totally failed Inglewood, completely failed Inglewood, which I think is another example of, of a system that doesn't work. The state had took over Inglewood because of both finan financial mismanagement, but also it had very, very low academic performance. And the district today is actually worse off. So, so the state, you do have to have real education expertise in terms of running school systems. Also, one of the priority jobs of the state superintendent is to serve school districts, to serve superintendents and county superintendents to help them get better and help them better support the teachers and principals who support kids. So, so it's hard to see how this job without leadership in running schools can be successful. For a quarter of a century, the state superintendent has been held by a person in the legislature who had a very strong voting record with the existing education establishment who then get this job. It's time for someone with education leadership experience. And to the question you asked, with education leadership experience, the more diversity, the better. Because that's actually how our safe state is. And that's, I think to me, I'm just saying, it's the best thing when in terms of running organizations to the cultures. And you can look at the cultures I've done. The good news about me is you can look at the record. Look at the record. Partnership for LA Schools. We had, the, we had a high proportion of school leaders of color and senior staff in our team of color, much higher than the district average or the state average. That, that's what you see, both in terms of male, female, and across races and cultures. Similar at Green Mountain. So I've actually done that in terms of the state level, absolutely. You, we have to have leadership that's representative of our state, also that's highly competent, and also that is willing to question things at the way they are. Leaders who have proven success on pushing back on the system is absolutely essential. And that's what I'll bring to the table. So I absolutely commit to having a quota. Um, but more importantly, it's not just about the quota. It's got to be people who are willing to challenge the existing system and bring real practices to bear for our young people. Because they always, always, always step up when we step up for them. And it's time for our state to actually, truly prioritize our young people. And it starts with leadership. So I want to make sure we get it on the record that that is a yes and a yes to a commitment to, to including an inclusion rider that really addresses uh, in, uh, ensuring that there is reflective representation in your administrations. Yeah, I think reflective is right. Like yes. a, hard, a hard number, right? You know, but flat, so yes. 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 And I like, I like Mr. Tuck's response about saying that we will have not just a quota, but those who are qualified. I think that they exist. The one thing that I would say I think is slightly different, you're correct of the situation in Inglewood, but the Office of Education in the state is not running that school district. They have appointed a trustee who has a job to oversee that district, and those trustees have failed to provide any support. I know, because I've worked with trustees in Oakland Unified and in West Contra Costa, and what they do is they take a $100,000 a year salary, and they show up at one school board meeting in closed session and do absolutely nothing to help these districts. And I'm very proud that just last week, my legislation provided $20 million to help OUSD with their financial situation and the ability to sell the surplus property so they can get the quality programs that they need. And we did the same thing for Inglewood. And we changed the structure so that the state uh, trustee is no longer directly appointed by the superintendent. 
It is a combination of work between the state superintendent and the county superintendent because the state superintendent, you're right, cannot supervise the district from 3,000 miles away. And so now, because of my bill, there will be new leadership at the local level to ensure that Inglewood and Oakland and the other districts that need additional help are getting the support that they need. Yeah, I just, I just had that. Whether it's a school board or a state who's over a school system, the most important decision that that body makes is hiring the superintendent. The most important decision. So you need to make sure your leaders understand what, what are the qualities of a high quality superintendent. How do you make sure you're hiring somebody who's going to actually, to your point up front, prioritize the budget for our neediest kids? So it's absolutely essential that you have expertise because your job is to hire the people who are doing the work in front of our children. So there is a lot of passion up here on the stage. And, 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 and absolutely, and since it is, I'd like it to be directed for this next question. Um, something that I think a lot of us are passionate about getting uh, to a resolution for, and that is pensions. Um, in 2013, school districts contributed eight. 8.25% of teachers' payroll for pensions. 8.25% in 2013. Today, that number is 16.28%, and it is projected to grow to 19% by 2020. Those contributions come directly from school budgets that would otherwise fund smaller class sizes, more programs for students, more counselors, more paid for teachers, and other areas that directly improve the education of our children. Folks have been sounding the alarm bells for a really long time about the rising costs of providing pensions. Um, and currently, I believe the latest number was about 270 billion, that's with a B, uh, in, in uh, pension costs with approximately 107 billion of that being unfunded. So would love to get your thoughts on what you plan to do uh, in your administration to address this issue that quite frankly, uh, many of us feel like the legislature and our governor have been kicking down the road for years and years and years. Yeah, I don't think it's a feeling, I think it's a fact. Right, Sacramento has actually not addressed this issue, and every single year it has grown, uh, it's actually hurting our kids. And actually, to your point, when they addressed it in 2013, the, the, what is a $100 billion on the education side for teacher unfunded liability was just pushed back down to school districts. And school districts have now had to spend more money on pensions, less money on programs, less money on kids. And if you really break it down further, public schools in California are now 76% of kids are kids of color in our public schools. 60% of our kids are low income. That is our student population. It's being money taken from kids of color and low income kids going to uh, pay unfunded liabilities for folks that look very different than our students with different economics. And it's a tough issue because certainly people who've earned their pensions need to keep their pensions. That, that, that you know, you're not gonna take away pensions from folks in this state. Uh, at the same time, we are right now funding our pensions literally on sacrificing our young people's future. So for me, what do we do? Step one is immediately, hopefully with the governor, and, and to clarify, I do have uh, a relationship with, who I think will be our next governor, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, and, and look forward to working closely with him. Um, you hopefully gotta get the governor involved because it's such a big issue, but with or without, immediately gotta launch a commission. That includes our labor leaders, that includes hopefully the governor, that includes our kind of pension experts to get and put a hard deadline on it. when are we going to stop this? Not just a commission that goes on a shelf, but serious business. Secondly, look at other states. Other states have actually taken real actions to start addressing their pension issues. There are no easy decisions. It will require shared sacrifice. But we know is well, who can't pay the price? Pensioners who already have their pensions can't pay the price, and kid, high poverty kids in our schools can't pay the price. So what do you do in between? Third is we have to bring transparency. Most of the public doesn't realize how big this issue is. You know it, I know it, a lot of folks here know it because we're close to schools. Most taxpayers don't understand because our elected officials have not actually brought it up at all. And if you talk to any superintendent state, number one issue, school board superintendent, is this growing pension issue. 
Fourth is we have to change what's called the discount rate. We, we are still as a state estimating that we're gonna get more money back from our investments and pensions than we're actually getting back. And every, every year you do that, you have actually a bigger and bigger issue to solve. And then we have to put all issues on the table. So we do have to look at state contribution to pensions. We do have to look at unearned benefits. Do you change benefits both for new employees or for folks who haven't actually earned those benefits before? There will be no easy decisions. It will require more revenue and more shared sacrifice across the board. But step one, it requires leadership. And, and, and the right question to ask is, where has the existing state superintendent who sits on the Cal, the Cal Sturf board, which is the, the board that manages pensions, why haven't we moved forward on trying to solve this problem, even though it's the number one issue for superintendents, even though it's an issue that really hurts our lowest income kids? And, and we gotta make, move, move forward on it. And I, I'll sit back and tell you, like, this is not an easy issue, but it's also why having someone who's not a politician this job matters, because too often politicians avoid the tough issues. We gotta take it on. Our kids absolutely need to have to have it happen, and if we don't, you're going to see more and more school districts going bankrupt in the not too distant future, which is absolutely unacceptable given that it's our kids' greatest need in our public school. Uh, confession: I am a politician. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's about me. Um, you know, I couldn't avoid a tough issue <laughs> if I tried because they usually fall on you, and you got to face up to it. And um, I'm a politician who has the opportunity to work in education and has devoted his life to education. <laughs> And as a school board member, I had the pleasure to work with leaders who um, helped us make the toughest decision that you can imagine to change a pension benefit, to change retiree medical for our employees, to stop the promise of retiree medical. And it saved our district from bankruptcy. It saved hundreds of billions of dollars. And you can't imagine a tougher choice than what our district had to make. And I have to, I have to stand up and salute the person who was the president of the board who steered us through that tough process. You know why? Because people vilified her and she's a teacher, an elementary school teacher who stood up for our district and showed me how to make those tough choices. Um, please uh, allow me a moment of personal privilege to say we saved those hundreds of millions of dollars from pension obligations because of Audrey Miles. Please stand up, Audrey Miles. Please stand up. A fabulous kindergarten teacher, a great board president, a great coach and mentor who showed me that the only way we get through this is to make your tough decisions. We bargain those conversations with our employee groups. Our employee groups, you know, they didn't come along right away, but they made tough choices to say, you're giving up benefits for future members will not get retiree medical health to save our history and it saved hundreds of millions of dollars in unfunded pension liabilities for our district. Now, I've convened a work group that has actuaries, and has government officials, and education officials to talk about what are we gonna do for pensions going forward, because it is true. It is a tough issue for every single school district. And I talk to superintendents all the time who say that even with the help that they've got from the state, and even though we've given them more, um, that the rising cost of education have been great and have been greater than what they receive. I fully support people being able to have a pension. I think everyone should have a pension. And I don't, I don't think we should frame this conversation in saying that providing a pension is what's robbing our kids of our education. Because even, even with the rising cost of pensions, even, you know, even before that, our kids were being failed because we had a structural deficit in our state budget and how it works. But we must close. And I want to be a superintendent who helps to make that happen because I understand that having been a teacher, having been a school board member, having been a legislator, I understand that we need permanent revenue to support it. As someone who, on the first night I was sworn in as a school board member, I was asked to vote to close 10 schools because the state budget was so bad. I cussed a whole lot of bad words that night. And I said, I'm not doing that. They said it's bad for kids, but we're going to actually do it anyway. I said, well, if it's bad because we've got no business doing it. Have the political will to do something different. My colleagues and I work with all the local city councils, and they gave us millions of dollars to keep nearly half those schools open. What I'm saying is, to be superintendent, you have to understand from many layers. Direct education, having worked with kids, having worked with principals and families, you have to understand the way our systems are built and be able to work with the governor to make sure we stop passing down all these unfunded mandates onto our school districts so they can balance their budgets, provide a pension, 
and not at the expense of our kids. What one thing you mentioned in your mind is it's not, when I say politicians, I think it's important to look at the facts. This law was passed in 2013, five years ago, where the formula was set to increase the pension obligation of school districts. It was before you, it was a year before you got there, but it was passed. Since that time, the legislature has not tried to introduce laws to change that. And, and so it's, it's not just theoretical, it's actually facts. And it's important when you look at the record, when I say, hey, the politicians haven't solved that, it's not rhetoric. And, and so the question becomes, if, if, if we're putting in, you mentioned just you know, numerous bills forward on a number of different issues, wh where are the bills on these most complicated issues and why, why haven't we put them forward for the last four years? And if it hasn't been done in the past, why, what, what, where's the confidence that actually happens going forward? Like that's, I think we have to look at people's records to see what have they actually done in the past on these issues. Yeah. Well, I want to first of all encourage the audience, if you haven't already, if you have a question, to go ahead and, and write that question down on the forms that were given to you and, and pass them uh, forward. Um, but I want to close up with the, with the final panel uh, question uh, on uh, another one of those issues that not surprisingly for many of us, has not been talked about or introduced, and that is reforming Proposition 13. Um, talked about sort of tough conversations, tough decisions. Um, there are many of us who believe um, that when it comes to education, it really shouldn't be a, 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 a tough decision to make. That if we say we value education in our children, um, then that is what our budgets should reflect. Uh, one of the topics that has historically been sort of talked about in closed quarters and whispered about, but is now thankfully being brought forward in a more public uh, discussion is reforming Proposition 13, very specifically to close the corporate loophole uh, to possibly help provide a permanent funding stream, as you referred to. So, would love to get your thoughts on a do you support reforming Proposition 13 for that specific reason, and what do you plan to do uh, in your role as Superintendent of Public Instruction to continue to push for that systemic reform that needs to happen in order for us to really start uh, prioritizing through budgets uh, education in the state of California. So, um, you want to do rock, paper, scissors to see if you have My answer is the same either way, so it doesn't matter though. I have supported reform of Prop 13 um, for 12 years as a public official. I've talked about it in every single election that I've ever had. I've supported legislation that would have made changes to Prop 13 that would protect <laughs> seniors and homeowners and small businesses from having to pay anymore and would have immediately provided another $8 million for K-12 education in the state. Um, the only way we're going to change Prop 13 is by putting it on the ballot and letting you, the voters, make the decision. Um, and that is the requirement to change the tax. It has to go to the ballot. And so, as superintendent, I will continue, as I have throughout this entire campaign, I have never equivocated on my support for creating a split rule tax to properly fund education in our state. And I will make that my top priority to help champion the campaign in 2020 um, to make, that sure, make sure that measure Passes. It will generate $11 billion for the entire state budget, about $6 billion for K-12 education. And so I will champion that, and I don't know how to say it. I unequivocally support uh, split role, uh, always have, and will continue to champion that as uh, super tech. Well, since Senator McDermott and I agree on this issue, uh, it, it's the corporate side of Prop 13 has to be fixed. We shouldn't touch the residential side. Housing costs are just way too high in the state and don't make sense. Um, when I think about the work that I did in our schools, as I mentioned, we had about 15,000 kids. We raised $100 million over 10 years. So it's actually about 800 bucks per kid more, which is actually around what we get with, with Prop 13 on the corporate side getting passed. And we were able to, we rallied the city of LA with the mayor and the school district to work together. We ran a PR campaign um, throughout LA and just really pushed the public to get more involved in our public schools, raise additional dollars, which allowed us to pay more for principals to come to Watts and East LA and South LA. Allowed us to invest more money 
in teacher professional development. A lot of us actually launch a parent college on Saturdays, so 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. in Watts, East LA, and South LA once a month. We actually ran classes for our parents to learn how to get more involved, more engaged in their schools. A lot of us have a zero period, a seven period, to give kids more time to be successful. And those are the kind of things that we can do if we actually get more revenue going to our schools. And that's the real possibility. We know that our kids step up, which is one of the reasons we had so much success in our schools. I think it's also important that we can't stop with just Prop 13 on the corporate side. Because even when we get that pass, we'll probably go from 41st, which is right now we're 41st uh, in funding when adjusts for cost of living. That probably moves us up to like 30th, you know, 28th. We gotta over time get the top 10. The state should have the best public schools in the nation, which require much, much more funding. So I think we gotta think about how to get both long-term sources of revenue as well as short-term. I mentioned earlier, online sales tax, got passed, let's get that money for public schools. Cannabis passed not too long ago. That's supposed to go both for prevention, healthcare, but also some of that, there's room in that law for some for education. And then we've talked about prisons a lot in this conversation. And I ask you again, look at people's record. Legislature in the last several years has given almost $800 million more to prisons in the state of California in spite of the prison population going down. That money could have been utilized for schools. Is it hard to make those changes? Yes. Is it hard to kind of tell some people no? Yes, but when it comes back to budget and priorities, that, that's where we gotta get serious on all levels about more funding for our kids. Public education should be the number one policy priority in the state of California for the next decade. Number one. Agreed. Uh, at, at this point, I think we're going to turn to our audience uh, for some questions. I believe Nolise is going to join us up here to share with us some questions from some of you. Wow, we received a vast amount of questions, so thank you guys very much. We will not be able to go through them all, but what I'd like to do is, for the ones that we are not able to answer, I'd like to compile those questions and get them to both candidates um, in their offices, in their camps, so that they know what you guys asked and how, and, and be able to respond to you in some form, because I think the questions that we received were awesome and across the board. So um, I think uh, the first thing I want to do is I want, I'd like to call up Betty Williams from the NAACP. She wanted to ask a question. And then um, after her question, I would then ask um, a couple of questions. I don't know what our time frame is, but I will ask. I got a couple of questions that were good for the both of you, and then I got one or two that were individually. So I'll ask those in, in fairness to each of you. Thank you, Nellie's. You're a little bit taller than me. Um, I'm Betty Williams, president of the Greater Sacramento NAACP. And my question, you actually touched on it. The Greater Sacramento NAACP commissioned uh, San Diego State to do a study on expulsion and suspensions of African American males. And as a result of that, um, it was no secret that the African American male was suspended five to seven times more than any other race and gender, and African American females were close behind. What surprised me in that study, um, Dr. Luke Woods came back and said that the largest number of expulsions happened between the age of six and seven years old, so kindergarten to third. We base our prison on third grade scores. The highest code was used by defiance. More than 80% of the African Americans suspended and expelled was used on the school code of defiance. The question with this, um, two part. The other part of the um, study, when the kids were asked who did this, for the most part, everyone knew who the, who the teachers were. And there were only maybe a few teachers in the same school that was doing most of the suspensions, the top 10. Half, more than half were in Northern California. The largest school district is Los Angeles County. So if you have your largest expulsion suspension in Sacramento, Oakland, Vallejo, that tells you something. So the question is, there's a code out there that's targeting black males. Would you, be, would you consider doing something to do a moratorium on a code or something like that? I heard you talk about equity, but I didn't hear a detail on what we can do to um, stop 
the suspension and expulsion of African American males? And what do you do about teachers who are consistently using these codes to get rid of our children in these schools? Yeah. Great question. I, thank you for the question. I read the research and uh, I'm very proud that just last week uh, we passed legislation to get rid of uh, the use of defiance as a reason to expel them. You know, I'm never going to be on the sidelines. I'm going to be on the front lines. And, and I, if we can together, we need to put pressure on together on the governor to sign that legislation. I thank my colleague, Senator Nancy Skinner, who is the primary author of that. I give her props for bringing that forward and working on that for two years. And we work with her. I'm a member of the Education Committee to get it out. And so now it's on the governor's desk to be signed. So that's the first step. To your point about teachers, uh, I would suspect that those teachers who are the constantly suspending are the ones who probably resist when the school tries to bring in restorative justice and other programs. And so uh, I think we should continue to expand on restorative justice. You know, I don't know if Sacramento, uh, the district was one of the ones that received our grant of the 30 school districts, but I'm looking to expand that to more districts to our state. Um, ultimately, the way we coach and teach uh, with teachers has to be that we give feedback. If some, we see that trend, we give feedback right away. My concern is that the way we do things in this state we wait until after teachers have been making mistakes for two years to say, oh, this ain't working out. That's too long. We should be working with teachers from the time they start to give feedback, positive and constructive, and then give them a coach or a peer who can help them to make those improvements. Now, if they cannot make that turn along the way, we have to have that tough conversation that says, this isn't the right profession for you. Ain't nothing wrong with that. This isn't the right profession for you. And so I believe firmly in that. I practiced that in my life as a, as a school board member and as an educator, uh, and I'm willing to support legislation to do that and to work with our districts on how to do a better job. Uh, yeah, so, so first, to your point, thanks for the work on that bill. It's an important bill. Uh, getting rid of suspension for willful defiance for K-8, just, it just makes sense, so appreciate that and, and your push on that. I think we need to look at expulsions as well, to your point, and really uh, quickly, right away, as state superintendent, look at the data there's just, kids should be expelled out of elementary school. It, it, there, there's just really almost no reason. There may be unique cases where transferring to a different setting and environment that may make more sense for a kid with certain uh, challenges, maybe, uh, but the reality is we gotta get serious about that. So we should, just like the work's been pushing on suspensions, we should really look at expulsions, particularly in K-5, and that's something the state superintendent can lead, I plan to lead, to really say that, like, what, what seven-year-old kid should get expelled from a school? Doesn't make sense, but like most things, that's step one. Right? Step one is actually get a policy passed, and step two is how do you help schools get better at doing this? So when you go and you take down local defiance, the next step is how do you help a school more effectively address issues that are going on at the school site? Some things we did in our schools when we moved really aggressively on suspensions. As I mentioned, 2008, we had a 24% suspension rate across our entire school system, down to 2% today, um, and it's mostly, most still in the high school level. Um, we first said, let's actually create a, a room on campus if kids need some space to go to and have actually counselors there to work with our kids. So like, it's not in school suspension when you're sitting there at a desk you know, doing nothing. You actually have people working with the young people during that time. So the state superintendent can share best practices with school districts and schools throughout the state on how do we actually help our young people if they are having challenges. Two, as the summit member third mentioned, we gotta just get serious about professional development, both when teachers are in teacher training programs. State superintendent sits on the board of Cal State. Cal State actually develops over half of our teachers in terms of teachers who teach in the state. We gotta get serious in our teacher training programs up front on areas like restorative justice, like cultural competency. And the other piece that we forget often is when we bring in new programs to school, it's not just the teachers that need the training. The principals, the assistant principals, the assistant superintendents, and sometimes the superintendents also need the training. So you gotta actually think about cultural competency and about restorative justice across the entire system. If you just have a professional development with teachers, but principals and superintendents aren't bought in, you're not gonna see us really address these issues at a systematic level, which is where the focus needs to be. Thank you, and by the way, the, the um, research was done on both public and charter schools, thanks. Thank you, Betty. Okay, before I ask this first question, I'd, I'd quickly like to um, acknowledge uh, the Honorable Madeline, I think it's Cronenberg, and if I uh, messed up your last name, I apologize, with the West Contra Costa 
County Board of Trustees. So, I'm sorry if I missed it. Great. All right. So, this first question that I have. As a special education student advocate, I have seen the power that your engagement has in empowering students, improving special ed and general education. If elected, what actions will you take to empower student advocates and increase their involvement in education um, in education policy making? That's for the both of you. Can you just clarify your first part with special ed, second part with advocacy? Can you just please clarify? Yeah, I'm sorry, excuse me. Just a second half, can you read the second half? Oh yeah, uh, yes, so the second half says, if elected, what actions will you take to empower student advocates and increase their involvement in education policy making? Okay, so it seems like there's almost two questions, one around special ed, and then the second around uh, student advocacy, right? So, so uh, we'll take both with them. Special education, um, right now, we have 12% of our students are special ed. Uh, special education population, 11% uh, proficient in math, 14% proficient in English. Uh, we are not serving our special needs students well. That, that is a systematic issue that leads also to Washington, D.C. So to me, step one is I want to actually launch a lawsuit with other state superintendents across the country, both from Democratic and Republican states against the federal government, because the federal government has a good law in place that says we have to provide services to special needs students, both through the ADA Act and the IDEA Act, but they've totally underfunded that law. And in my experience in education, we found real value in leveraging the legal system. When the system itself doesn't change, leverage the legal system to fight for our kids' equity and our kids' rights. So step one is we want to see if we can start pushing on the federal government to actually fund special ed the way they're supposed to. Secondly, we have to look at the local control funding formula policy, which gives, again, more dollars for uh, English learners, um, foster kids, and our low-income kids, and think about, should we also have a concentration grant when a school has highly concentrated numbers of special education, because there are still unique challenges there. We provide more dollars for special ed, um, but I think when we have high concentration, we need to get serious about additional dollars there. Third is, over half our teachers in special education today in the state of California are not trained to teach special education. And, and you have to solve that problem. And that's why I think you gotta think about, you know, overall I think we should do uh, free college, we commit to teach for five years for all teachers, but really prioritize special education, low income schools as a starting point. And then lastly, we have to look at training on special education. And this kind of per the prior conversation on suspensions, it's not just about training our special ed teachers. It's essential that our general education teachers understand our special needs students and our principals and assistant principals as we're moving to a much more inclusion model so we're addressing those young people collectively. Really quickly on the, on the student advocacy piece of it, uh, in the schools I led, and for clarity, I led district public schools for six and a half years. Before that, I led charter public schools, but the majority in district public schools. We always had an actual student advisory committee that talked to and then you know, kind of superintendent on a regular basis on policy and included that. And so one thing I want to do as state superintendent is identify regionally student leadership teams that are actually getting together both regionally with county students but also have subsetting that team talking to the student superintendent on a monthly basis. We can do it all remotely, you know, so kids aren't having to always fly into Sacramento, probably fly once a year, but meet monthly. So we actually have student voice, student policy, student activism at the state level in terms of, of activism uh, with, with state policy. Special education is deeply underfunded. It had, has had a negative impact on everyone, our students, um, our, our administrators, and our educators. Um, you know, if we push on our congressional delegation, I believe that that's how we fight uh, what Trump has done. Because Trump and Secretary Voss, they're cutting everything. They're cutting the programs that would help us in special education. So we need to push Congress to push the president to properly fund it. But in the meantime, we've been working slowly to provide more and more funding. This year, provided $100 million for professional development for teachers. Most of that is focused on supporting our special educators. And so what it does, is, and then my bill this year will allow a veteran special education teacher to help our new special education teachers. So they get that support. Most of them feel burnt out and they feel like they don't have the resources that they need. And so we've got to continue to provide that. Uh, I'm going to be introducing again legislation that will provide more school psychologists and therapists and social workers in our schools. I can't tell you how many, how many districts for an IEP, you have one school psychologist who travels through the whole district and can't get to the IEPs. I'm very proud to support it. Um, you know, we've got to have the right tools. And I love working with the advocates who help our parents understand what their rights are in the law. 
and some of them are very informal advocates because we can't all afford to have an attorney to tell us what law says. There are some great advocates who've been helping our parents know your rights because unfortunately, that's been the only way that parents get what they are entitled to by threatening to sue the district. And so, I know Disability Rights California and so many other organizations and individuals who have been helping parents who can't afford to pay, and I'll continue to work with them. As it relates to direct student advocacy, I'm so proud of our students. Uh, you know, I helped to create the first ever student commission in the West Contra Costa Unified School District, where young people have their own way of speaking to the board about how they want their voice to be heard. And just uh, two years ago, the governor signed my bill that was written with students that guarantees that every school district and every school board in our state has to have at least one student voting member on the board so that we can have direct student advocacy on our students. I'm committed to it as superintendent. I'll work with the students who've been appointed to the State Board of Education and the student organizations that bring great advocacy. There are great partners. Um, when it came to the issues of you know, guns in school, we turned to our young people to help us talk about school safety. Because they know, like we know, teachers don't need guns in the classroom to keep our kids safe. They need resources and materials to educate our kids that don't come out of their pocket, and that we need real programs and real politicians with backbone to say we, don't, we need real gun control policies that keep our kids safe, and training for educators on how to identify risk and mental health programs that support our kids who've been impacted by trauma. These are the kinds of things that I'll do to support student advocacy as superintendent. Great. Assemblymember Thurman, this one is, was directed at you. Um, how do you plan to support new teachers? This is from a first year San Francisco Unified School District teacher. How do you plan to support new teachers professionally, financially, and with longevity? As I mentioned, I'm working on the scholarship program to support new teachers, to give the incentive to those who uh, choose to teach. And, you know, quite frankly, I think that part of the reason that we don't have as many uh, teachers of color is that for many of our folks who've been able to get an education, they've got to make a tough choice. And they cannot take the job that is low paying. And it is sad, but our educators are among the lowest paid and social workers. And so uh, I'm committed to supporting new teachers through scholarship programs through loan um, repayment programs that make it possible for them to become educators, through direct coaching and mentoring programs that I've been talking about today, and even to address you know, the issue of affordability of housing, because if you can't live in the community, I want the folks who are from that community to be able to teach in that community, and I'm prepared to provide that in coaching, I think, in professional development. I think we should change how we do professional development so that teachers get paid to do professional development during the summer before school starts, and they have time to plan together and team plan for how they're going to support their kids instead of asking them to come in in the summer on their own time and try to get their classes together and try and decide what they're going to do for the year. We've got to be, if we really, as you both said earlier, if it's your priority, put it in the budget. And that's not the way we've done professional development. And that's how I intend to support new teachers. Make sure they get coaching and support so they can be mentored by excellent teachers and the support for them to become excellent teachers. Mr. Tuck, this question was addressed to you. Mr. Tuck, as a uh, proponent of charters, uh, charter schools, how do you reconcile your position with multiple data points showing African American children are disproportionately harmed through lack of services or excluded by entrance and exit policies? Yeah, so a couple thoughts uh, for Claire. So as I mentioned before, I've worked in education for 15 years, the vast majority of that time, in district public schools, not charter schools. I started working in charter schools in 2002, helped create a group called Green Dump Public Schools, which served all the one kids, uh, Latino and African American were the two kids we served, helped create 10 new schools at Green Dot, all the one kids, all Latino, all African American. Eight of those 10 schools today are recognized by US News and World Report amongst the best high schools in the country. Kids in Englewood, and South Lane, East LA, really proud of our teachers and our principals our counselors who did that work. I left charters in 2006 to work in district public schools because that's where 90% of the kids actually are in district public schools. I think on the data that was mentioned, we have challenges, like charters are a governing structure. And I think nonprofit charter schools, particularly in low-income communities where the public school system, the traditional public school system has failed kids for decades, I think giving our parents another public school option is a good thing. 
because middle class and upper class families have never, ever, ever been stuck in failing schools. Upper class buys a house in a nicer neighborhood for a better public school or goes to private school. Middle class also able to maybe go to a middle class neighborhood or find a magnet school or pay for a Catholic school. It's only been our neediest families, typically African American Latino families, that have been in a community like Inglewood, where I worked in 2002, where Inglewood High School had a 4% proficiency rate in math and tons of violence. And in 2002, I met Shirley Ford, and who's a great friend of mine, and Shirley Ford, her son Rock was finishing the eighth grade, and that was the only option. That was her only option. She helped us build a new charter school. He graduated that, that high school, went to college, graduated college, teaching low-income kids in Houston. As relates to any school, charter or district, that is disproportionately expelling African-American students, suspending African-American students, not accepting African-American students, that's illegal. And, and you'll see for me, I don't care if you're a charter school, a traditional district school, a magnet district school. I mentioned equity audit early. Like we have to be very transparent at the school level and the district level. What are schools doing in terms of Disproportionate suspensions, disproportionate expulsions, disproportionate low performance. And the state, what has been doing literally for decades, is just let that keep happening. We will intervene. If districts aren't getting the job, the state intervenes right now when there's financial gross management. They do not intervene when there's gross discrimination, inequity, or ineffective academics. And we're going to step in, charter, district school, or not. It's got to be about our kids and success. Great, thank you. So this will be the last question, but before I Ask that. Let me acknowledge, and again, I apologize if I mess this name up, Jamoka Hinton Hodge from o Open Unified School District School Board. You're welcome. And then Deborah Benson, Antioch School Board. Awesome. Thank you, for, thank you for coming, ladies. So, this is the last question for the both of you. And I think this is a good one in the spirit of collaboration. <laughs> it's easy. Um, both of you have important ideas and proposals to make our schools more equitable and effective for our students. One of you will win and one of you will not. How will you collaborate in the future for what is best for our students? Yeah, I, I, I never like speaking for people, so I won't assume it, but no, no, I'm saying it's interesting. Campaigns are interesting because we see each other a lot, and um, you, you kind of, you, you're backstage for five minutes, like, hey, Tony, how you been? How you we both have kids in public schools. How are your kids doing? Um, and I, we don't know each other incredibly well, but I think that we both have strong hearts committed to kids, and I think that I know for myself, and I, from what I've known of you, and again, still get to know you, um, we want better schools for kids, right? Like, that's, I mean, we both have done this work for a long time. And different hats, different perspectives, um, but I tell anybody, like, like my mom raised me with very clear, like, get up, be a good human being, be kind to others, serve other people, do your best, and work with anybody that can move the ball forward. And ultimately, I obviously hope to win this election. I'm gonna work as hard as I can to do so. Um, whether I win or lose, I'm absolutely working with Tony, I'm working with everybody in this room, anybody who's for me or against me or in between. Like, our kids need all of us to step up for them, all of us. Um, and, and we can do it. You know, we, like, when we step up for kids, they shine. We've all had that experience in some way, shape, or form in our schools. And I just remind people, think if this state, to your original opening camera, like, think if this state said, we're going to do whatever it takes for our kids. Man, they'd step up. So absolutely, uh, day after and beyond, we got to work for kids. And, and people can disagree on things. As long as the North Star is putting our kids first, get serious about change, and um, let's make it happen. You know, I, I appreciate everyone's interest, and in Mr. Tuck is, you know, uh, we can tell each other's stories now. <laughs> uh, we've been on the campaign trail for so long, and what I appreciate about you, Marshall, is that, you know, you, you speak truth to power. You're very direct, and you, you feel that there needs to be urgency for our kids, and I appreciate that. We have a different approach in how we want to do it, and I think that you've identified the things that are broken. Um, I think, you know, I'm very focused on what are we going to do about that. And I would be happy to work with you on how we address the things that have been broken and the things that are going to be, that need to be fixed. Um, the space where I'm going to always be is on what's the solution. Um, Marshall, you're not the enemy. 
It is these systems that have kept our kids down that are the enemy. And anybody who wants to work to beat back that enemy, I'm cool working. I'm cool working. You know, as I said, this is my 12th year in politics. When I first got on the city council, the first thing they told me is, you can't make everybody happy. And they said this thing that has stayed with me. They said, do things in a way that make your grandparents proud. My grandparents passed away uh, before, you know, when I was a very, very young person. And so I said it like this. I'm going to do things in a way that will make my kids proud. I have two wonderful daughters, 15 and 12, who watch everything I do. They even called your campaign office one time to say, stop lying on my dad. <laughs> I told my daughter, I said, baby, hang up the phone. I said, we don't call our puppets. <laughs> True story. But, you know, I thought about it. After I got over the panic, I thought about it. You know, we raised you to tell the truth. And she told the truth that she understood it. So I celebrated her for that and for her courage. She's 12 years old, y'all. I celebrated her for her courage. And, you know, when I take a vote that they like, they tell me. When I take a vote that they don't like, they say, Dad, why'd you vote that way? They are, our kids are paying attention. And so I, I say that, that no matter what happens, my entire career has been about trying to help kids because everything that we talk about was me. I knew that I could easily have ended up in California State Prison. I ended up in the California State Assembly. I want to give that experience to all of our kids. I'll be happy to work with you, with you, with all of them, put this together. Um, whatever's best for kids is going to always be the way I approach this work. I think it's a broken time. I think I was just inadvertently, I wanted to mention one thing because um, I mentioned how I was raised. I don't lie. Uh, so, so, you know, I just think inadvertently that story, uh, saying that in life at some point, that's just, that's not the, I may, I may, I make mistakes, make just something differently. Uh, what, what, I, my house, I was raised, look at mine and tell the truth and be straightforward about it. So, so the, the, the story, which is a good story, I got if you infer in that line, I apologize. That's, that's, that's not the way I, I did not. Especially when talking about unity and working together for our kids. I, I'm glad you said that. It was, I believe that what my daughter heard was a commercial from one of your supporters, not from you. I will say that. It was an independent, I believe it was an independent expenditure committee. And so when I told her that, you know, I was proud of her for standing up for truth, I was not trying to back you. Should that. Call you a liar. Because Mary and Tuck checks these things out. I don't want her saying, Jesus, I was son, not, you're lying. You know? No, no, no. I was not backhand. My mom was old school. She'd come after me big time. I wasn't backhand trying to call you a liar. Um, when the commercial, when I heard the commercial, I tried my best to listen to it without her hearing it. Because her question to me is always, Daddy, why do people lie in politics? And I told her, sometimes people just want to win so bad they can say anything. And so I tried to hide it. I closed the door and everything. She heard it. I swear to you, the morning I was making her lunch for school, she went and read your ballot statement. And so she, she, she put two things together. The statement that you say that there's only one educator in the race, and then when she heard one of the independent expenditures say, she put that together and then found the phone number for your campaign office on the ballot statement. I couldn't believe it. And then called your office. And I was like, God, I hope nobody heard that message. And so I wasn't trying to back in call you a liar. When I called you out today, it was for the things that I heard you say directly about the district that I serve and about me. But I was not trying to back in call you a liar. And I appreciate you making the statement because that was not my time. Well, thank you both. Uh, I, I want to, in the spirit of uh, coming together, uh, want to thank you both for, uh, for having the courage to have difficult and hard conversations uh, about hard truths. I believe that now more than ever before, this moment that we are in is calling for uh, leadership. It is calling for people who will boldly and unapologetically stand up for the things that we say we value. Um, and what is that bill number that is sitting on, uh, on, the, on the governor's desk that, uh, to get rid of? Right now there are 11. So which one did you mention? Oh, getting rid of, <laughs> getting rid of. Uh, Willful defiance. defiance. Uh, it's a Senator Skinner bill, and we're going to pull up the number real quick and get it to you before. What is it? SB 607. 607. Six Thank zero you. seven. Thank you. Um, so I want to say that the superintendent of public instruction is just one part of this equation when it comes to public education. Our governor and our legislature are equal parts in that as well. And so we need to, as we move forward, look at not just the action, 
but the inaction of our elected leaders to really solve and address systemic issues that continue to perpetuate injustice in our educational system. Um, Bill SB 607 is sitting on uh, Governor Jerry Brown's desk. Um, I want to encourage all of us to use social media, to use old school media, to put pressure on <coughs> Mr. Brown to do the right thing, and to remind him that not only are we watching, but that this issue of black student educational success, similar to environmental stewardship, is also a part of his legacy. Um, I want to end with a couple quotes from the two of you. Marshall, you said that our kids need all of us to step up for them. Tony, you said that our kids are paying attention. I hope that whichever one of you is victorious this November will remember those words as you move forward and fight on behalf of our children. I want to once again thank Holy Names for hosting us, Sistelec, California Black Media, Owapa, and Black women from across the state for joining us. Thank you all so much. Thank you, James. Before we close, I'd like to acknowledge Del uh, Council, City Council Member Delcy Brooks uh, from Oakland. And we'd like to thank Holy uh, Names University uh, and Endowment. We'd like to thank Lanise Jones, Kelly Todd Griffin, Lanise Edwards, Tresla Gruber, Dr. Ramona Bishop, Regina Wilson, Kimberly Ellis, and me, Taisha Brown. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you all for joining us. What an awesome, awesome discussion. Lots of information. We hope you are all informed and educated and energized. The goal of this forum was to ask questions of the two candidates on behalf of the two million black Californians regarding educational issues that matter to all of us. We will continue the conversation over the next several weeks and we encourage you to share what you've heard today. We will keep you posted on future conversations and would also love your feedback on the forum. Thank you so very much, Louise Guerrero and Bradley Henry. Thank you.